So hi everyone. Um, I'm Ondra Hum and I will uh, lead this session. I just want to ask you if you have questions, please use the uh, Q&A uh, tool, which is located, the button is located at the bottom of, uh, of the window. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dan Larlus. She is a principal researcher at uh, Computer Vision Group at Naval Labs Grenoble. She also leads a chair around uh, lifelong representation learning within the Multidisciplinary Institute in Artificial Intelligence in Grenoble. Uh, she has received her PhD from India Grenoble, uh, the famous Lear Group in 2008. After that, she was for two years as a postdoc at uh, TU Darmstadt. And then she joined uh, the neighbor, neighbor Labs. She has published a number of influential papers on instance retrieval. She's also interested in representation learning, image segmentation. And today she will speak about her recent interest, which is semantic image and video retrieval. So Diane, thanks for joining us today and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be uh, talking at this workshop on instance level recognition. And um, as Andra said, I'm going to present something that is entitled From Instance Level to Semantic Image Retrieval. And um, during this presentation, I'd like to cover mostly two retrieval tasks. The first one is semantic image retrieval, and the second one is cross-model retrieval. But first, let's start with a little bit of context. So when you are provided with a very large collection of images, the most standard way that you would like to interact with this collection is probably by typing a text. If you're looking for images of the Eiffel Tower, most likely you will type so, and this will allow you to retrieve images of the Eiffel Tower. Another very standard way to interact with such a large collection is to provide an example image. Here, an example of the Eiffel Tower. So the second way of interacting with a large collection of images is what I'm going to refer to as image retrieval. Uh, and um, when a textual query is issued, then I'm going to call this cross-model retrieval the modality of the search and the modality of the database where you search are different. Of course, image retrieval has many very practical applications. Let me name a few. So first, let's assume that you have a photograph of a building you've never seen before and you would like to know where it is on a map. If you have access to a database of buildings that are attached with GPS information, then you can simply run image retrieval uh, query and recognize your building in the collection and place it in the map. And this can be actually used for retrieving more information about many different uh, of, um, objects, let's say. For example, if you want to know more about a famous landmark or a famous painting, you can retrieve more information with image retrieval, but you can apply that to get the reviews of a movie or a book. You can even get the ingredients of packaged food. And also it has been uh, as shown recently as a very powerful shopping interface. But there's, of course, if you query with a single image, that's very convenient, but there's an uh, inherent ambiguity. So what if you query a system with this particular image? You're probably looking for similar paintings or um, even better, other paintings of the same painter. And what if you get something like this? I would say that uh, that's probably not what you were looking for. And yet visually, this is very similar. So the ambiguity makes it application dependent. 
and people have solved that in several ways. Um, the earlier approaches tended to um, inject prior information by designing pipelines that would enforce some properties which you know are good for the, um, for the system. For example, some invariance properties or some geometry consistencies. And there's a long history of approaches that would handcraft, for example, descriptors like SIFT. Another family of approach would leverage training. And this is what is done by the most recent deep learning based approaches. And um, this is possible because you give an access to example queries and example of correctly retrieved results. And this is the kind of approaches I will mainly focus on uh, next. When we think about image retrieval, in general, we think about instance level retrieval. You give as a query an example view of an object instance, and um, what you would like to retrieve is um, are more views of that exact same object. And this is exactly what's happening for the landmark retrieval challenge that uh, uh, we've seen more about earlier in the first session. What I would like to look into today during this presentation is more, are more complex queries. Let's assume that you query your system with a complex query such as this one, which involves a full scene with many different objects. Most likely, you're not looking for the exact same instance of the t-shirt you see in this picture or the exact same instance of a ball. Probably, you want to retrieve images that are telling the same story, the same high-level semantics. So if you look at potential results for that query, maybe they're visually different, but they all have something in common. They, sell, they tell the same story of a little girl that is playing the football with a man, probably her father. And this is what I'm going to call semantic image retrieval. And this is a task that I'm going to look at next. So this brings me to the first part, which covers semantic image retrieval. And this is um, actually joint work with my former colleague, Albert Gordo, and we presented this work at CVPR a few years back. So I've talked about semantic image retrieval, explaining what it is about. And there's maybe a question that you will ask me, is the semantic retrieval task even well-defined? And that's a good question. And we started this project by asking ourselves this exact same question. And we run a um, user study collecting human annotations to understand what people would understand as two semantically related images. So instead of asking people to rank a very long list of images, we provided them with triplets, a, pos a potential query, and um, two options to choose from. And we asked people which one of these two options is mostly related to the query at a semantic level. And as you can see from this example, this is a fairly um, subjective task. So maybe not all of you would agree on the correct answer. So we ran what we thought was a okay, fairly small scale study, but that's the best we could do at that time. And uh, we uh, asked 35 annotators and we showed them 3000 image triplets. And we collected a leave one user out agreement score. So this means that we count for every user how often he or she agrees with the others. And as we can see, this is a subjective task. This is not 100%, but we reach close to 90%. So this means that it's a task that we can um, try to predict because people tend to agree. So now the second question that we could ask is what could capture semantic information? And in this case, uh, we ran a second study. We used the visual da genome data set, which is nice because it comes with a large number of images, 100,000, but most importantly, many extra annotations. We have captions at the region level. We have a list of the objects contained in the images. We have um, a scene graphs, attributes, and so on. So what we did, is to build several descriptors that would look at um, these different annotations. For example, uh, concatenating all the captions describing the same image or building histograms of objects contained in the image. And we looked at the descriptors 
and how well they could predict if two people would consider two images as being semantically related to each other. And it turns out that among all these possible annotations, region level description are what best capture semantic information. So it's good to know that if we have access to captions associated with images, we can pretty well predict if two people are going to consider two images as semantically related or not. Now, when you want to deploy such a system, it's not very um, practical to assume that we have captions, right? So now can we learn a purely visual representation, if possible compact, that would be good for the semantic retrieval task? And um, what we decided to do is, as we have captions, at train time, which we use for our study, maybe we could use them for training. So we assume that these human captions are available at train time and we use them as privileged information. And then we are going to leverage these human captions as a proxy for semantic similarity. So let's look at what these captions look like. Uh, here are two images that are, I would say, fairly dissimilar. But if we look at their captions, for example, let's look at the caption of the image on the left right. We have a woman under an umbrella, brown leather boots on legs, black umbrella is open, and step leading to a door. Then, if we look at the captions, we see that these captions use more or less the same ter terms and use, um, well, describe the same things. So we're going to decide that these two images are semantically related at train time. And this is how the training is done. More precisely, we're going to build visual representations by building a visual embedding space. So this means learning um, representation function phi that transforms every image into a vector in this visual embedding space. And if two images are considered similar according to their captions, we're going to make sure that they land close to each other in the semantic embedding space. And the other way around, if two images are considered as dissimilar according to the captions, we are going to make sure that they fall far apart in the visual embedding space. So this is because we have captions at train time. And we do that for many such constraints. So we're going to use many such triplets. We'll see that in a second. Now at test time, remember we have no caption. There's no caption with a query image and there's no caption with the images in the database we research. But if our visual embedding space that we just train is any good, we simply have to embed the query image, every single image of the collection, and then we look for the closest image in the collection to the query and return those. And they're the ones that are supposed to be semantically related to the query. So how do we train this embedding space? We decided to take a learning to rank approach and we train with a triplet loss. Other options could have been used, but we picked that one. And I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with the triplet loss, but just to recap what it does, it takes three images at the same time, a query image, an image that is relevant to that query, and an image that is non-relevant to that query. And what we would like to make sure is that the query image, the representation of the query image is more similar to the representation of the relevant, then the representation of the non-relevant by your margin. And we do that for many such triplets. And that's how we can obtain our visual embedding space that is used then without captions for the test time. Now, if you look at how captions are used, they are actually only used to decide if two images are relevant to each other or not. What we could think about doing is to learn a second embedding function, theta, that will actually try to embed the captions in the same space, building a joint embedding space. And we're going to um, add some constraints. So we're going to make sure that the image of the query is close to the caption of the relevant one, or at least closer to the caption of the non-relevant one, and vice versa, we want the caption of the query to be similar to the image of the relevant, or at least more similar than the image of the non-relevant. So how does, it, does we transform that into losses? On top of the visual loss I mentioned before, which is using only the phi uh, visual embedding function, um, or CNN, 
Then we have two additional texture losses, which are actually cross-model losses. They're using both the visual embedding function and the textual embedding function. So we have additional constraints with additional triplets. And this is how we build our joint embedding space. To experiment with these models, we use the visual genome data set, which we split into a training set where captions are leveraged. Remember, that's our privileged information. And we have a validation set and a test set where captions are not used. And for the evaluation, we evaluate on the triplets for which we have human annotations. And we want to make sure that the visual predictions of our system agree with the choices made by the users on these triplets, building this user base score that I'm going to report next. So these are our experimental results. Obviously, we double check, random is giving us 50%. If you randomly choose one as the most semantically related to the query. We extracted a nautical one. So this one is an approach that would be cheating and would look at caption at test time. If we had access at test time, which our method doesn't have, then this is the kind of result we would get, the 76%. Then we have two baselines. Um, very standard visual baseline, which is a model pre-trained on ImageNet, and Wasabi, which is training, but not exactly for the end task. And then we have our two proposed approach, um, the one that builds a purely visual embedding and the one that builds a joint embedding with image index together. And what we observe is that all forms of training improve over the um, pre-trained um, um, ImageNet model. But Wasabi doesn't improve as much as the others because it doesn't optimize for the end task. Both our approaches uh, improve much better and they're actually kind of comparable to the Oracle one which uses text. This means that these visual representations are now able to do um, as good as the teacher they've been trained with. And finally, uh, we see that these two different embedding space, the one that uses only a visual loss, and the one that also embeds text perform on par. So the text one is not bringing any improvement, but we'll see that it can be useful for something else. Let's look at a few qualitative results. So first, let's take this example query on the top. We have this couple at a wedding, cutting a wedding cake. And if we look at the top semantically retrieved images for the baseline, we see that uh, we have images that are relevant. They contain the same objects. They have people. They have, uh, I said, same object like plates, ties, forks, and so on. But they're not exactly related to the query, or not so much. Now, if we see what happens after training, um, I would say that we have images that are more related, at least in my opinion. I think we have, uh, so we have, Many, in many cases, couples, we have people in more formal settings. And in some cases, we even have people at a wedding cutting a wedding cake. Now let's take this other example. The query is on the left. This is this man riding a horse. And if we query the system just with the image, we get more images of people riding horses. Now, because we have this joint embedding space, we can also embed text. This means that we can start doing a little bit of arithmetic on our queries. Word horse, embed the word elephant in this joint embedding space, and then we simply do the embedding of the visual, the visual information, the image, minus the embedding of horse, plus the embedding of elephant, and this is the kind of results we get. So as you can see, we have people riding elephants. I'm not going to claim that this works so well for every single arithmetic we could think of, but there's a fair number of examples where we have this kind of behavior showing that this joint embedding space captures semantic um, at a high level enough so we can start um, having image and text works together. This brings me to the end of the first part of the presentation where um, I showed that we could define a retrieval task semantic retrieval task, where there's a large enough interhuman agreement between um, about what is semantically related. Then we've seen that human captions are a good proxy 
to predict if two images are related or not semantically, then we've seen that we could build a good visual representation for this task. And if we build a join abelian space for image and text uh, together, then we can start doing queries that are more complex and that combine image and text. Now I'd like to move to the second part of this presentation, which is about cross-model retrieval. So this is a, a collaboration with uh, Mike Vray and Dima Daman from the University of Bristol and uh, Gabriela, my colleague from Naval Labs. And we presented this paper last year at ICC. Um, I mentioned earlier what cross-model retrieval is about. It's when you query with a modality to search for another one, like you query with text to retrieve images or you query with image to retrieve text. And in general, this is solved by building a shared embedding space a bit before, a bit similar to what I showed you before. So this means that if we have these three different modalities, we have three different embedding functions. The green arrow um, represents the text embedding function. The blue arrow represents the still image embedding function and pink arrow correspond to a benefit function for the videos. And what we would like to have in this shared embedding space is that everything that embeds something related to a cat is close to each other in that space and far away from everything that is related to dogs. And we can do that for more than just object categories. We can do that for more complex things like actions. In this embedding, we make sure that everything related to cooking pasta is close to each other in the space and everything related to preparing juice is close to each other and far away from cooking pasta. This work was motivated by um, the Epic Kitchen dataset and the fact that we wanted to tackle cross-model fine-grain action retrieval. This dataset is interesting because it focuses on fine-grain actions and the descriptions are free-form. So compared to prior work on uh, action retrieval, and in particular compared to a standard action retrieval, here we would like to really go finer grain and um, be able to understand subtle details between two actions that are fairly similar to each other. And compared to what exists in fine grain classification, we would like to move beyond classification and move away from a predefined set of labels. And we would like to be able, most importantly, to tackle open vocabulary queries and um, deal with actions in the train time. So the approach we came up with to solve this task is assuming that at train time we have pairs of caption and video sequence. And what we propose to do is to take the captions and to split them into their different parts of speech. So here, this caption I put me in on a bowl of dough is going to be split into a verb part, put, and the noun part, which will combine meat, bowl, and dough. And once we've done that, what we propose to do is to build separate embedding spaces for the different parts of speech. This means that first, we're going to look at how we can embed the video sequence and the verb part of the caption put in a verb embedding space close to each other. And in parallel, we want to embed the exact same video sequence and the noun part of the caption close to each other in this noun embedding space. So we would like to learn an independent embedding space for each part of speech. Then what we would like to do is to learn to combine these different embedding representations into a final representation which lives in the final embedding space. So we take the visual representation of the video, its verb embedding part and its non embedding part, so these two representation vectors, and we learn to combine them in order to produce a final visual representation for the, the video sequence. And at the same time, we take the verb part of the caption and the noun part of the caption, which have been respectively embedded in the verb embedding and non embedding spaces, and we learn to combine them as well. And now we make sure that the final representations of the video and the caption are close to each other in this final embedding space. This full model 
I'm going to refer to it as GPOS for joint part of speech embedding. So what are the advantages of these multiple part of speech embeddings over a single embedding space? First, these different parts of speech produce complementary views of the data. Second, instead of only relying on training, we can also inject a little bit of prior information about what we know about text in this model. And uh, finally, um, this model can generalize across several actions that involve a common part of speech. Because now if we have examples of, an, of open fridge and open drawer, and we have another, option, uh, another action involving open with an object we've seen before, even if we've never seen open that object before, we can recognize it. For our experiments, we focused mostly on the Epic Kitchen dataset, which is, as I mentioned, a fine-grained video retrieval, uh, a fine-grained vid action dataset, and we focus on fine-grained video retrieval. So the data set is first person and unscripted, and people have been cooking in their own kitchen. So for the, for the data set, we have 32 kitchen, some are seen during training, and some are only seen at test time. So we have two test sets, one that looks at the kitchen seen at train time, and one for the unseen one. And what we're looking at is video to caption retrieval and caption to video retrieval. And these results I'm going to show are about mean average precision. So we have several baseline, a random one and the CCA one. And then we can compare to a joint embedding space that will use the entire caption and um, another approach that will use these uh, different embedding spaces for the um, parts of speech, but then we'll simply concatenate their representation. And we have our final representation um, that we propose, which is learning how to combine them. And we see that for the different settings we consider, this is the approach that gets the best results. Let me show you a few qualitative results. These are video to text results on EPIC. So for three different video queries, we show um, the top 50 retrieve captions as green if they're relevant to the um, query and gray if they're non-relevant. And this number in front shows the rank of the first relevant caption in the retrieve results. So we see that our full approach gets um, a higher number of results than the um, baseline which builds a joint using the caption in full. This brings me to the end of this part. Um, so to conclude, fine grain cross-model action retrieval can be successfully tackled by learning distinct, distinct embedded spaces for each part of speech and learning to combine these embeddings in a final representation. What I've not shown uh, quantitatively here is that such approach is able to generalize to zero-shot cases, which I think is an interesting property. So what's next? If um, you're interested in this, um, in this data set, then um, let me tell you that there's a new version, the Epic Kitchen 100, that is now available. And um, there's a brand new challenge, the Action Retrieval Challenge. It has more kitchen hours of recording. So this is the end of my two parts. And actually, I couldn't help but add a very short third part, which is, um, a bit disconnected from retrieval, but I think it has something to do with the rest because it shows an example of what you can do if you, if you have an image caption pair. So I'm going to quickly show you that. Um, this is a paper that uh, we presented at this conference a few days ago, and this is joint work with my uh, colleagues, uh, Berlin Sarilis and Julien Perez from Naval Labs. So I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that you can pre-train general purpose visual representations using fully supervised classification as a proxy task and category labels. This is in general what people do uh, with ImageNet and its labels. They produce good visual representations that can then be used for any subsequent tasks they're interested in. So other classification tasks, but you can also use that for object detection, instead segmentation or image retrieval and so on. And recently, people have focused into reducing the annotation cost. So let's look at that in a slightly more detail. Let's look at the proxy tasks that people have used to pre-train visual representations. As I said, 
if you have access to a large collection of images that are annotated with um, labels, such as image net and its fine grained labels, then you can use fully service classification as a proxy task. But this requires expert knowledge. So in order to reduce the annotation cost, there's a recent trend and a large body of work that has focused on self-supervised learning, where you have a um, large collection of images without any annotations, but then you can create proxy tasks by fabricating your labels and creating visual representation that will prove to be uh, performing um, quite close to the fully supervised approach. But in general, these approaches, they use either image net without labels or less curated data set, but maybe even um, larger ones, um, and that they're computationally demanding. So what we're proposed to look at now is, what if we have image caption pairs? We have less images, smaller sets than ImageNet, but we have caption as a side information. Can we leverage this information to learn visual representation from scratch? And in order to do that, we first have to define a proxy task. So the proxy task we proposed is image condition mask language modeling. Maybe you're familiar with the mask language modeling task using NLP. This is uh, fairly related. Here we assume we have this image caption pair. We're going to mask a token in the caption, and we're going to try to predict the mask token by using the rest of the caption and the entire image. So that's a proxy task. Now, to solve the proxy task, we define an architecture. Uh, this architecture is based on representations, a visual representation that is going to transform our image into an interesting representation useful for the proxy task. And this is exactly what we hope to train from scratch. And that is going to be the visual representation we train. We assume we have a textual representation that here assume given, so pre-trained, a language model. And we're going to have auxiliary, auxiliary modules as well to solve the proxy task. Now, what do we require? We need this, um, this network to encode both input modalities. As I said, it's going to embed the image and the text. We would like to align the representation um, of the semantic concepts between visual and textual. And we would like the visual representation to be able to focus on image regions that correspond to the mask token in order to solve the proxy task. And by training this multimodal architecture for the proposed proxy task, we show that we can build a good visual representation as a byproduct. I'm not going to show any quantitative results um, in the interest of time, but we obtain visual representations that are quite competitive compared to those obtained in a fully supervised manner, so standard image net pre-training, and uh, also uh, competitive with some of the recent self-supervised learning approaches. Instead of quantitative results, I'd like to show you qualitative ones. So here I'm showing the attention maps that are produced um, by our representation that we've trained from scratch by masking different tokens in the caption. So we can see as we change the token, the attention map changes as well. So we can see that the representation can focus on relevant parts in the image. Uh, as a summary of this very last short part, um, so in, in this work, we've proposed image condition mask language modeling as a proxy task, and we used it to learn visual representation from scratch using image caption pairs. And uh, what we observed is that the visual representations obtained from these models, they're competitive compared to other ways to produce visual representations, uh, fully supervised, weekly supervised, and self-supervised approaches. And we use uh, fewer images, so 10 times less images than um, ImageNet. And this time I reached the end of my presentation. Um, I hope it was clear and uh, I would be more than happy to answer your questions. So, okay, Dan, thanks for the presentation. It was excellent. Uh, I will remind the audience that we have uh, some time for questions. So please use the uh, question and answer button to ask a question. Meanwhile, I have, a, uh, I have some questions. So in the first bit, 
Uh, I was wondering how exactly do you measure the caption similarity? And is it possible because people usually when training try to mine for uh, hard positives and hard negatives. So uh, do you do that as well or is that difficult with the captions? Okay, so that's a, that's a very good question. So first, I think there are two parts in this question, right? How we measure the similarity between the captions. So I haven't detailed that here, but we tried a few things. So remember this work is uh, a few years old, so we didn't have like BERT, magic BERT model or so on. So we tried things that are maybe um, more, more standard. We tried the TF IDF representation. We try word to vec with feature vectors on top and uh, several measures used by um, to evaluate captioning like Meteor. And it turns out that uh, it didn't really make um, any difference whatever representation we used in that case. I think this is because we had uh, a large number of captions per image because we use a visual genome. Maybe with a different data set, the conclusion would be different. So we went for the simplest. We used the TFIDF based measure, which looks at the words. That's why their color needs slide actually, because it gives you an idea of the kind of similarity we have. And then based on that, for every query, we can rank the batch from the most similar to the least similar um, according to the caption, right? And what we did is uh, something that is uh, fairly standard with triplet loss and that we use also in the past for instance level retrieval, we mined uh, hard triplets. The only tricky bit is that um, text is a bit more noisy than what we used to. So we went for like, let's say semi-hard triplets and we made sure that we increase the difficulty as we train. So it's true that it wouldn't train as well if you would go for random triplets. Okay, thanks. So then in the second part, you started with an example where you were three embeddings uh, from text, from image and from video. So uh, if you really did that, uh, what do you think would, uh, would that have a positive impact on text to image retrieval if you added the video as another modality that would uh, regularize the embeddings? Okay, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. So this is really an illustration, right? Because in, in principle, you can embed everything in the same space. Actually, we've never tried. Um, I tried only building uh, embeddings with image and text or video and text because the different projects were in different domains. But it's true that if we work with the same domain, we can probably do things like that. Um, I don't know if you would add the regularization or if it would make the task too difficult. That's just a good point, but I have no, no experimental evidence to, to provide to answer that part. And then uh, just a technical question. The, uh, when you were showing uh, results of uh, video to caption retrieval, so the captions, do you do the code uh, uh, or invert the embedding, or are you just finding nearest neighbor from the captions that were used uh, in training? Are you talking about these qualitative results? Um, or maybe I misunderstood the question. So, so when, when you have video uh, to caption mm -hmm. retrieval, so how do you how do you get the caption? Do you synthesize it from the descriptor, or do you find the nearest neighbor? from uh, the training set. Okay, it's true that um, the generating the caption could have been interesting, but in that case, we went for the standard cross-model retrieval setup. So we assume that we have all possible captions from the entire data set to search from, and then they're all represented in that embedding space we've built. Um, and then what we do is um, to rank them according to this similarity. Um, and that's how we, we retrieve this top 50 in the results. Okay, we have, we have uh, a question from Emilio. Nice talk. In your experience, how important is the length of the representation, the dimensionality of embedded space? Should it be bigger in the case of multimodal scenarios compared uh, with the only image-based uh, retrieval? Hmm. 
So um, from what I remember, um, we, we tried several dimensions and um, in our case, the larger the better because we could capture more information. Maybe at some point it would start overfitting, but we haven't reached that space. So um, I think a large representation is very useful because it um, describes um, many of the things happening, but then you have the problem of storage. So if you want to search efficiently in, an, in your database for search, then there's a trade-off to be found, found. Of course, compression is still possible. Um, okay. So if there is no other question, uh, I will have one last. I, I, I have also. So. Okay, here we go. Okay, good. So thank you for the, as always, very, very nice uh, talk. So uh, my, my question, okay, I have a couple, but then we, we don't have time. So for the last part where you're masking uh, the, the words out, so are you randomly masking words out or I'm wondering if it makes sense to focus on uh, particular parts of speech, for instance, that maybe now, like I, I see this example, that maybe the nouns make more sense and the verbs that they correspond to actions less sense. But if one would go and try to do something like that on videos, then you start to focus on the verbs too. Hmm. Very good point. So. Um the choice of the mass token has definitely an impact on the training. So we run an ablative study and we tried a few things, uh, but we mostly focused on what we thought could be observed in images. So we focused on nouns, on um, uh, verbs and on adjectives. And we see that depending on the capacity of the model, uh, we obtain um, in general better results if we look at more things. So our result, for example, with the ResNet 50 backbone gets uh, very good results if you look at verbs, nouns, and adjectives. Um, and of course, we, we try to discard the other parts of speech, which would be more difficult to look at in the image because at the end of the day, what we want to achieve is uh, building a, a good visual representation. And, and it's okay if uh, we're not so good at the mask uh, prediction task. So, thank you. Do, do we have time? Should I go for one more? I think we started a little uh, later, so we started around 2 or 5, so it's, it's fair. We can go for a couple more minutes for sure. Yeah. Okay, so going back to the, to the first part. So, for instance, there you're trained with triplet loss that uh, needs uh, binary supervision. Let's say it's, it needs binary pairwise uh, labels. And, and to obtain that, you start from the, the textual similarity, which is actually a continuous measure. So there, okay, you have some uh, continuous similarity between two uh, images, two captions, or you can rank uh, all the images with respect to one of them. So could this be like uh, more useful to stay to that, switch to a regression task or to, I don't know, non-standard losses? And then I'm also wondering whether this actually indeed plays some role when you start to map both modalities in the same space. So maybe there, indeed, it goes beyond binary supervision. Great. Yeah, so um, that's a very good point. I mentioned relevant, non-relevant for the triplets because this is how the triplet loss works, but you're totally right because we measure a similarity between these groups of captions. We have a supervision level that is fully continuous. So for that particular implementation that we report in the paper, we went for thresholds. So we have hard decision, this is relevant, this is non-relevant, and that's what trained best. Um, and then that, that trained better than having actual triplets that would look at precise rankings. But maybe it's because the triplet is, um, is only looking at a um, course view of the data. I know that there's recent work that have worked on these list-wise losses that can look at the, like an entire list and the entire rank of all this, so maybe we could revisit this work and train with some kind of, well, not the AP loss, but an NDCG loss or something like that. And, uh, and maybe we would get a better result, and especially for the joint embedding space, maybe that would make a difference. But I can only speculate because at the time we used this uh, triplet loss with binary supervision. Thank you. Okay. So, if there are no other questions, then, then thanks a lot.
and thank you very much. <laughs> and yeah, let's move to uh, next 